This podcast is being brought to you in part by the veteran-founded Hero Soap Company, located in Phoenix, Arizona. In today's environment, we must be aware of the products we apply to our skin. As a two-time cancer survivor, I cannot afford to take chances, and I use these products myself. The soaps will leave you feeling clean and refreshed. All the products made by the Hero Soap Company are made in the United States with the highest quality ingredients sourced from companies in the United States whenever possible. The products are made in small batches to ensure high quality and contain premium essential oils and fragrance. All Hero Soaps are created without synthetic colorants, parabens, and sulfates that are irritating to the eyes, skin, mouth, and lungs and are cruelty-free, meaning these products are not tested on animals. Each 5-ounce bar of soap is handmade in Phoenix, Arizona, and the body wash is available in 8 ounces with such refreshing scents as the woods, tea tree, lavender, the fields, bourbon, lime, the pines, and arctic. You will absolutely love this soap. Please also check out their gear for sale. All the products are reasonably priced. Being veteran-founded, the company understands the dedication and sacrifice that each family makes to serve their country. A portion of sales is donated back to charities that are focused on helping veterans and our first responders. Over 1,200 bars have been sent to our deployed troops. Please check out their website, HeroSoapCompany.com, for pricing and a detailed description of all the products. When ordering, use the code RAP for a 10% discount. The company information will be listed in the podcast notes and featured on the podcast website, Facebook group, page, and the podcast Instagram. Welcome, everyone, to It's a Wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport, two-time male breast cancer survivor and full-time lymphedema thriver. Before we start, I would like to thank all of our listeners, our sponsors, and supporters that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all the provinces of Canada, and over 45 countries around the world. The podcast has been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts from thousands of podcasts on the web in that category, and is ranked by traffic, social media followers, and content freshness. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Juano Ocampo from Los Angeles, California. Juano is a two-time brain cancer survivor. Juano was born in the Philippines, raised by two loving parents, and lived there for the first 15 years of his life. The family relocated in 2005 to Los Angeles. Since he was 12 years old, he only has loved one thing, basketball, and till this day, it is still his passion. Now, out of nowhere, at the age of 18, Juano was diagnosed with pineal germinoma, a rare type of brain tumor that occurs mostly in younger kids. He not only got it once, but he got it again in back-to-back years. Wano is the author of the book, Impossible to I'm Possible. He is here today with us to share his story and to pursue his life's calling of sharing with others life's true meaning and to tell of his blessings and for others to witness firsthand the possibilities through the impossibilities in life. Welcome, Wano, to the podcast. Hello, I'm so honored. We are honored to have you, young man. Uh, you're, you've All done right. some fantastic things, and you've gotten through some some uh, of life's challenges and yes, hard ones at yep. that. And, and we uh, we are honored to have you. Uh, tell us, Juan, what what was the first fifteen years uh, growing up in the Philippines like? How was that? We're going back oh, to the beginning. Man. Well, 
my first 15 years in the Philippines, yeah, you know, I was chubby. Yeah. <laughs> I was really chubby and um no, I I I've I've heard you were up to 260 pounds. 260 pounds. Yes, sir. Correct? 260 pounds. Yeah. 260 yeah. pounds. Yep, I did. I was. How did you gain all that weight? Eating. <laughs> <laughs> Eating basically. Like to eat, huh? Yeah, it's kind of like yeah, kind of like an orgasm or something, man. Like food. <laughs> yeah. So, what was life like for those first fifteen years? Tell us a little bit. About um. That. Yeah. Um. It was fun. Um. I was. I was getting. I was always taking care of my parents. You know what I'm saying? And I was. I was. Um. I love basketball since I was twelve. And yeah, we're gonna get into that. Now, uh -huh. th now, when you were twelve years old and you started loving basketball. Were you still on the heavy side? Not that much yet. Not okay. that much. Yeah, okay. not that much yet. Not until I was I I was in high school. That's when everything like <laughs> went downwards. <laughs> <laughs> really tough. in my way. Yeah, but still I played. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and did you make the team? Um, back in the Philippines, I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. I did. So the weight uh probably came off from running up and down the court. I would assume. Not really. <laughs> no. Not really. I was still fat though, but you know, I hustled, so you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Well you're job, looking so you're looking fit and trim today. Oh, thank you. Yep. I did lose all the way. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you and your sister, uh, uh -huh. you relocate to Los Angeles. Yes. In twenty oh five. Uh what was that trans transition like culturally, uh socially, making friends? school wise tell us about that was that a oh, hard transition um yeah at first in the beginning yeah because you gotta adjust everything because it was a lot more different like school wise back in the philippines better here in america yeah and so all i had to do was just be confident and just try to make friends as much as possible try to kind of like commingle with others <laughs> try to get a feeling and how it is right you know what i'm saying so what was uh the educational system in the Philippines compared to what it was when you when you arrived here. Were you ahead of the were ahead of the curve or were you behind the curve or how that work? I was when I moved here, I was kinda of like behind. I fell behind because we didn't know that here in America you have a middle school, seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. Like in the Philippines, we didn't have that back in the day. From sixth grade, after sixth grade, you go freshman year high school. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so back there I was a junior. So when I moved here, I went back to freshman because it was two years, right. two years minus. So how did that? Uh, how did it work with making friends and things like that? You know what? Just go with the flow. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying just so go with the flow somewhere. and just try to make friends as much as possible. Just just try to talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. Was your command of the English language pretty good? I mean, did you speak oh, English yeah. in oh, the yeah, Philippines? Yeah. We were taught to speak English. We were taught to speak English since we were a little taught. So that was kind of like a big advantage for us. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. But you still speak Filipino as well. I yeah, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. I do. Okay. So at the ripe age of 12 years old, you're developing a passion for, for basketball. Yes. Uh, what, what inspired that and what drove that passion? Um, nothing. It was just kind of like I went to that summer camp and I just fell in love with the game. Right. Yeah. Just a passion that came. <laughs> okay. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And till now, 20 years running. <laughs> and you're still, still my passion. Yeah. You're still playing? Yeah, I'm still playing. Well, uh, are you in like a men's league or? You can say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Just pick up games, that type of thing. Oh, uh, I do both. What other passions do you have besides basketball? I'm writing. <laughs> I think writing? I'm an author, right? <laughs> yeah, you did write a book. I read the book. Writing, and I do love kind of like a little bit of cooking. Okay. Yeah, kind of like, and yeah. What are, you, uh, what are you doing now for, you know, for a job and stuff? Um, Now I'm hoping to get back to culinary school and try to work things out in the kitchen. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, for my future. Okay. So let's touch upon that weight again. Uh, <laughs> your overweight is 260 pounds. Yes, sir. Uh, the cause of it, uh, you said, was just kind of just eating, right? Yeah, eating. Over, yeah, over eating. controllable eating. <laughs> what was what was what was the uh, motivation 
for you to lose the weight. How did you lose? Well, that? when I moved in America, I tried out for the team, right? It was summer. I tried out for the team. I made it. I I made the cut. And then, but the coach did tell me that I needed to lose weight. Yeah. The only thing that I made the team was I hustled. And that was pretty much it. I, it was kind of like the impression I had for them, to them. But yeah, and every single practice when I was big, I, I almost felt that I was going to lose breath. <laughs> I lost my breath every single practice, but I hustled hard, but I didn't need it to lose weight. And so the year later, I lost all those weight. I went to the gym and started running. And six months later, I lost 92 pounds. Wow. Yeah. How From 260 is- to 168. So I'm a former runner. How far? What kind of runs did you do? Did you? Uh... Oh, no, just um treadmill. Just to lose weight. Wait, okay. Yeah. Weight loss purposes. Let me take a very brief moment out to alert all our patients and caregivers out there that rare patient voice, a supporter of the podcast, is paying for your input. Patients 16 years and older and caregivers, family and friends of any disability, disorder, syndrome, illness, or condition have the opportunity to express their opinions through surveys and interviews to improve medical products and services. Who knows your journey better than you? Rare Patient Voice puts you in touch with researchers who are developing products and services that can help you and others with your condition. These researchers need input of patients to develop products and services that have significant impact on patients' lives. Over the past nine years, Rare Patient Voice has paid patients over $10 million. When you join Rare Patient Voice, you may be invited to participate in interviews, surveys, or online communities where you will share your insights. Rare Patient Voice usually has hundreds of studies running at any time, so there are many opportunities to participate. You will earn $120 per hour for participating in these studies. By making your voice heard, you are a catalyst for change. Rest assured, your input will be used to help other patients like you. There is no cost at all to you, the participant. You can get more information and sign up by clicking the link in the sponsor's notes. Yeah. Did you, yeah, did, yeah, yeah. Did you join any, uh, uh, I shouldn't say join, did you register for any 5Ks or 10Ks or anything like uh, that? No, 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 no. No, no, no marathons. No. No, 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 no marathon. No half marathons. <laughs> okay, so at age 18, uh, you're diagnosed with a rare tumor, a pineal mm-hmm. germinoma. Yes, pineal that's germinoma. A, that's in 20, 2008. Uh-huh. How did the doctors find out you had a tumor in your brain? I mean, it's a rare thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did they find out? Um, When I was rushed to the hospital at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, when I was at the ER... They they immediately they immediately um brought me to the CT scan test and from there that's where they found it a big tumor underneath my brain underneath yeah, my yeah. brain yeah so that's where that's when they knew that was causing all the pressure so after that after the CT scan they rushed me to emergency surgery for a temporary tube placement to be placed to alleviate the um pain and to drain the fluids. Yeah, constant yeah. pressure. So that's how everything began, basically. Well, take us back before that. Tell tell the people out there, uh, this this uh, pineal germinoma. What were the what were the first symptoms that occurred? Oh man! And how quickly did the other major sh- symptoms okay. progress? Um. Well, the first symptoms was extreme thirst. Extreme thirst, it began in my sophomore year, probably the second summer summer of my sophomore year, close to the summer months. It was just an compulsive drinking of water. Wow. That it was got a thirst that cannot be quenched. I was always thirsty no matter what. Like I get up in the middle of the night and drink water and hours and hours and hours. And when I got to my junior year, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Kind of like it was just an instant craving for ice or cold water. So this is this was actually going on for for more than twelve months. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, a year, yeah, a year and wow. something, yeah, yeah. And then finally, at December of '07, I was here at home. I was it was me and my mom watching TV, and yeah. then all of a sudden, just came out of nowhere this throbbing pain, throbbing headache. Inside my head, kind of like squeezing my eyes and then kind of like pounding the brain, kind of like mushing it. Right. Almost actually screaming in pain. And my mom's going, Wano, what's wrong? What's wrong? 
Yeah, I was going to like scream, ah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And so I, I ran to the kitchen, took some Tylenol, and went away. It was good for that moment. Yeah. And I was kind of like hoping it wouldn't come back, but like a like a band aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like uh, a band aid for a moment. Yeah, for a moment. Yeah. But when December passed, January came. It came back not once but twice. Now that set an alarming note. That right. what is going on? Right. What is this? So I went to my aunt's office. Um, she was a doctor, and she took some tests like blood works and all that. Everything went fine. And so we just took it kind of like a normal, probably um, probably just a very headache, something like that, or kind of like sinus. Maybe yeah, a yeah, migraine yeah. or something. Yeah, like migraine, a probably a um, severe sinus infection, something like that. Yeah. So she prescribed me some medications, but that did not work at all. <laughs> right. And so just as months passed, it just became more often and up, often and often and often and often. The pain just kept, kept coming back. And until May, it happened every single day. Every single day, the pain was just there. The wow. um, nausea and vomiting had them all up. And then the um, tingling, kind of like the numbness. That's kind of like feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From It actually started from my shoulders and spread to my legs. And then I was kind of like having some shaking, kind of like some seizures as well. That I could not understand, kind of like twitching uncontrollably i was in school too when it that when that happened <laughs> so yeah and so, well with all this going on what uh-huh. was what was the uh the catalyst that you finally said okay enough i gotta go i gotta go fig- get this figured out because obviously you were getting misdiagnosed uh-huh yeah yeah I'm, <laughs> i was getting misdiagnosed but still we were kind of like afraid to you know like diagnose it ourselves or something so we did not want this to um we didn't want to think about the um the worst possible outcome out of this yeah so we just kind of like neglected it you know what i'm saying kind of like ignored the um the facts the symptoms and all that yeah not until yeah. that june of 2008 june 8th 2008 where i was just, everything just went so south that the pain the migraine the seizures, the numbing, the nausea and vomiting was so severe that that was the time that I had to be rushed to the hospital. I needed to be rushed to the hospital because it, it was just uncontrollable. I could not control my nausea and vomiting and the, um, the numbness was from my head to my toes and I could not barely walk. It was so hard to walk that I needed help at that very moment. Yes. So uh, if you had to do it all over again, you would have gone in a lot earlier, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Basically. So the moral yeah. of the story is if 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 you, mm-hmm. don't, if you don't feel good. Exactly. Yep. Don't Go to just, the doctor. <laughs> don't, don't wait around. Exactly. Don't wait around till, yeah. till it becomes like something serious. Yeah. Because really, in this case, but... it, it really did. And uh-huh. uh, when they treated you, I understand you were in the ICU for three months. I see you. Yeah, three months. Three months. Wow. Yeah, three months. I was there laying down with tubes in, in my head from top to bottom. I had a catheter in my private area. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I could not move. I had patches in my chest, and it was loud. It was really loud in the ICU. Now, when all this was going on, you were still in high school. High school, yep. I was a junior. <laughs> and were you... Even even uh, through this uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, the numbness, and everything, were you still attending school, or were you missing a whole lot of school? Um, it had when I was first diagnosed on June eighth. I was kind of like at, it was actually finals week of yeah. my junior year. Yeah. So basically, that whole that whole three months that I was in ICU, it was summer months. But then when I was a senior. I couldn't go to school because I was going th- through chemotherapies and radiation and still going through MRIs and all that. So my parents and myself decided that I need to be homeschooled. Yeah. Homeschooled for my senior year. So that's basically what happened. Okay. So were you able to graduate high school? Yes, uh, yes I did. E- even with being diagnosed in your senior year. And yes. uh, uh, what? so what were the steps uh, needed for you to graduate, what was the process like? Um, I need to um pass the um KC test, 
It's called California High School Exit Exam. I need to um pass it because I actually um failed to pass like the math portion of it when I was a junior. So I have I had like two chances to pass in my senior year. And so yeah, I took it in my senior year was out well, I was homeschooled, so and I passed it. So and in the right. process, I was so lucky to have a um a blessing. <laughs> And my my homeschool teacher, his name's um James Fitzpatrick. I'm uh, kind of, he's kind of like a um father figure to me. Right. I, I love him as a dad. So yes, he helped me all throughout. You must have spent a lot of time with you. Oh, always, always. Yeah. Always, always. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about the treatments that they administer to you. Uh, okay. During the first diagnosis, from start to finish, on the first. All diagnosis. right. First diagnosis when I was in ICU, it was just the um the tube, just to um drain the fluids and some um the surgery, the sharp placement, and the biopsy. They took a um sample out of tumor. They wanted to take the tumor out, like the whole tumor out, the optic nerve. If they took it out, I'm gonna go blind. So it was too risky. So the only possible treatments to shrink the tumor was chemotherapy and radiation. Yeah. So after the um, shunt surgery, they brought me back to ICU and there the um, doctors explained everything that they successfully implanted the um, shunt, but the tumor was still there. A piece of a tumor was still there because they couldn't take it out. So the only possible way was for chemotherapy to eradicate it and radiation therapy. Yeah, I've been down that road. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I not, know. <laughs> not, not very pleasant. Uh, oh, it you... is not pleasant. Yep. Did... All right, Ron. How did you handle that? Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, my first diagnosis, <laughs> really, it, it, it hit me hard, like, the first time. Yeah. Like, the nausea. Like, I just got up, like, in the middle of the night. I was admitted, so it was always in the middle of the night. I had to get up and throw up, go to the bathroom, throw up. And just, yeah, just see very nausea and vomiting. That was it. <laughs> yeah. I did not really take it well during my first four cycles, <laughs> during the first tumor. So, oh, when... Yeah. So one year later, we're going to age mm -hmm. 19, 2009, it uh -huh. comes back. Yeah, it came back without one. <laughs> where where were you at that point in time? And what further treatments uh, did it take to stabilize everything? Oh. Well, it was after my first week of college, actually. Actually, I had an MRI appointment. Then two days later, the doctor's appointment with Dr. Finley for the results. And Dr. Finley came in inside the room, shook my hand, and immediately told me, all right, we need to talk. And immediately as he sat down, he told us, it's a tumor. <laughs> it's a tumor. And he explained, like, further treatments for it. And he said, like, Let's break away for a moment to address those men and women over 45 struggling with knee pain to alert you how you can learn to cut your knee pain in half without harmful drugs or invasive surgeries. Todd Kaliskis is an injury prevention expert who specializes using Eastern and Western holistic practices to speed up the body's natural healing processes. Over the past 10 years, he has impacted the health of over 100,000 people through his online health publications. His clients include everyday people, professional athletes, U.S. military, and even nursing home residents. If you are over the age of 45, your doctor might have already told you to manage your knee pain and arthritis by gobbling up drugs like ibuprofen and acetaminophen. You may have even gotten injections or a full knee replacement. New research is revealing there are three main causes of joint pain, cellular inflammation, postural misalignment, and cartilage deterioration. The CDC reported that joint pain and arthritis is now one of the top chronic conditions leading to death and disability. According to research from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, there is a simple exercise that can decrease your knee pain by 58%. The participants in the study did one simple isometric exercise a few times a week and saw a huge reduction in pain. Isometric exercises are a simple, effective, and an easy exercise whereby you increase the tension in the muscles without moving your joints. It gives your body the ability to use its muscles without ever moving and allows your knee to release your pain for good. This easy-to-perform and painless exercise successfully outperformed the drugs and pills in both pain relief 
and knee joint function. Now, Todd has collected the most effective variations of isometrics that anyone can do no matter if you have had knee surgery, struggling with grinding knee joints daily, or simply have that nagging achiness you want to eliminate. His greatest techniques have been combined into a simple and easy to follow five minute ritual called the Feel Good Knees Method. It is an easy to follow method that only takes five minutes a day to do. The program is so quick and easy you will be shocked by how fast you will be free of knee joint pain. Here is what's included in the method, a companion program giving you a visual guide how to perform the exercises, a pain reduction tracker to measure your pain reduction progress, and a video library to learn the perfect form to perform the exercises. If you order now, you will get two free gifts, a postural alignment guide and a one-minute rejuvenation finisher guide. The price of the method is affordable as Todd's goal is to reach 1 million people. The cost to you is $15 for the digital version and $15 for the printed version, plus $7.95 shipping and handling. There is also a 60-day money back guarantee. Please refer to the link in the podcast notes to order and for detailed information on the course. The um, chemotherapy this time would be like five, seven times stronger than the um, previous ones I had. Wow. Yeah, because they they did not want to take a risk again. (laughs) Right. So, yeah, and he was kind of like upset with himself because he felt kind of like a failure. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. These, these oncologists do. I mean, yeah, they want to uh-huh. see uh-huh. you succeed in the exactly, treatment. exactly, and, oh, and yeah. they they take it to heart. You know, it's uh-huh. like they take it to heart. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, what did I do he wrong? He was really upset. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was really yeah. upset. Yeah, and so, so well, you said you know when it came back, were the symptoms the same as the first time? No, because they caught it right on time. It's kind of like at its first stages, so it's. It was still kind of small, but visible in the scan. It's so small, it, not, it, they, not they enough found to it, cause symptoms. They found it on a routine scan? Yeah, routine scan, MRI scan. Wow. Yes, and then two days later, my appointments with the results, and that that's when they found out that it was a tumor. And <laughs> So you yes. really never had any... Uh, symptoms. Symptoms yeah. from no, that. No, but a second tumor, yeah. Thank God, yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. At least you, escaped, know. you escaped that. Uh uh-uh. I was just really glad that they caught it in time. Yeah, you know? absolutely absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that chemo was seven times as potent. Yeah, seven times first. stronger. Yeah. Did you seven have a lot of not, did you have a lot of uh issues with that? No, not really. Amazingly, I took it pretty well. Like the nausea wasn't there. <laughs> but so maybe, the, maybe they upped your dosage on all that anti nausea stuff. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too, probably. And give you a lot and, of uh, uh-huh. Steroids and, and all that. Chemotherapy and along yeah, the way, uh, like Did you have to have sorry. radiation again too? Yes. Um that was the last treatments. That was the last treatment that I had, radiation therapy. Okay. Yeah, and but between that I had something called the PBSC collection, peripheral blood stem cell collection. It's kind of like a process of harvesting um your bone marrow through stem cell. Yeah. Yeah. So you lay down for a week in the hospital and then you, they um kind of like poke it with two huge IVs. It was really big. And then it harvests kind of like all the stem cells. And the reason for that, because the chemo was so tough that not only would it, it, it depletes my blood and platelets, but my bone marrow too. So it was too risky. So they need to harvest some, save it and transfuse it back when I was, when I was in BMT, bone marrow transplant. So you went through the ringer. Yeah, really. I went through the ringer, basically. Why don't I want to find? I want to ask you where where did you find the hope uh, you desperately needed during each diagnosis? Who was there to bring meaning to your situation? Oh, my faith, my faith. So tell us about that, because oh, I know faith. what I know what it's like to uh-huh. have to have go through one and then another one pops up. I know, I know, and I know. It's tough. You know, I, mean, I know it's tough. Yeah, I know. I did ask God that, that how come, you know, why are these happening? Like, why did I do wrong and all that? But eventually I found um, I found a purpose for, for all of my pain. He brought purpose to all of it. And along the way, 
I did find the meaning of all my pains. I did find meaning of it. It was wisdom. It was wisdom. It was wisdom that I gained from it. So he did not want me to give up to my dreams. So, so then I could inspire myself in the aftermath and ask myself, why can't I get back to the basketball court when the demands of the basketball court is not even half of a fraction compared to the demands of brain cancer twice, back to back here setting? Why? Right. Mm-hmm. So how important to you is your faith? How did your faith in God overturn your impossible to I'm possible? It's wisdom. It just made it was this wisdom that made me ask myself through comparison to my pains and to my dreams. So basically that's pretty much <laughs> what motivated me to get back. And to inspire others, I want to share my, you know, my blessings to others. So you're calling uh, to share with others uh, life's true meaning. Tell uh-huh. us, tell us in your opinion, what is life's true meaning? Live life to the fullest. Even when the impossible comes, face it. Be willing to face it because it has a purpose. There's a reason for it. Use the pain to eventually motivate yourself in the aftermath and ask yourself the same question I, I've asked myself. Why can't you get back to the dreams you've once given up? When the demands, when the demands of your tribulations outweighs the totalities of your dreams. So why can't you get back to it? Why can't you get back? Inspire yourself and get back to what matters most to you. So you pretty much lifted yourself from your bootstraps up and said, I'm 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 gonna get back to my dreams. Uh-huh. I'm not gonna uh-huh. let this put me down. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of people say, uh, why does this happen to me? Why? Yep. Me? Yep. I know. My, I know. My model from what I learned is why is this happening for me? Right. Right. Use right. that line. Why is this happening for me? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, it turns everything around. Mm-hmm. It and, does. And, it, and, it, and it, really, it really gives you that impetus to, to, to keep going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wrote the book. And I read it. Very good book. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, Impossible to I'm I'm possible. Uh What prompted you to write it? Uh, What what prompted you to make yourself vulnerable out there? And and tell us about the book. I just wanted to share my story. I wanted to share my blessings to others and for others to um, dream big that even when the impossible comes, that they'll be able to surpass it and find meaning through their pains. And so where can it, where, can, where, where can someone obtain the book? Where can, where can people get the book? How can they purchase the book? Oh, online, online, okay. online from Amazon and Barnes and Nobles from okay. Kindle and Audible actually. Yeah. I now okay. have a Audible version of it. Oh, excellent. Now we're going to yeah. show, we're going to showcase the book uh, on our Facebook group. Okay. So we're going to showcase it. Uh, so what is like your life like now? Uh, what are you up to? Are you doing any advocacy work for any groups? And do you have any new projects on the way? I'm just trying to get back to culinary school for now. And I'm still, I'm still playing basketball, though. Still playing basketball for a team. And I'm just trying to live my life as best as I, as I could, you know, live life to the fullest. Are you going, you said you're going to school? Mm-hmm. Culinary school. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. uh, in Los Angeles? Yes, Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be a big time chef someday. <laughs> um, hopefully. It, it is my second passion. So Excellent. Excellent. Uh-huh. Are you doing any work with any advocacy groups? Or are you just... No, I do not. Right now, okay. I do not. You yeah, think I'm you might be doing right that? Right now. Yeah, you yeah. might be doing that down the road when you get some more time? I think so. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. Why not? Right, right, right. Now, for those out there listening or uh, have or know someone who has a serious uh, challenging adversity, I want you to tell the audience what advice you have for them, people who are struggling. Okay. Well, for the ones who are struggling right now and the ones who've lost hope and with, with the ones who dreams crush and everything's kind of like feels impossible right now and you feel like everything you you just lost everything yeah just take take pride in what you're facing right now be proud 
be willing because all of those acceptance that you've done the the courage will eventually overturn to become the perseverance and the hard work the hard work that you'll gain when it's time for you to claim your dreams because you all just got to ask yourself, why can't you reclaim what you've lost when your dreams can't even compare to what you've survived? <laughs> so nothing right. is impossible. And you've proven mm-hmm. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Through God's help, I did. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wano, how can people contact you? They want to Maybe they want to contact you, uh, ask you advice, whatever. Uh, is there a way they can contact you? Oh yeah, um, my my Facebook, my Facebook, and um, now, do you have a do you, why not? Do you have a Facebook group? I do not. Okay, so they can get you on Facebook. Not. Well, uh huh. How do they reach you on Facebook? Um, just probably send me a message or a um PM me or a um friend request if they want. My um my. Email ad is J-A-L-O to 190 at AOL.com. So, yep, you just type in Facebook and it'll it'll um, immediately pop up to my profile. So, okay. and then if they want to reach me out to a mobile, it's uh, my phone number is 626-549-8976. All right. You don't mind that going out over the airwaves? No, no, no. Okay. Well, no, you know, no, how, no. You know how some uh-huh. people are. They want to keep, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I'm anybody... willing to help, so, yeah. Good, good. Okay. Uh-huh. That's what we want to hear. I want to thank you so much, Juan, for being on the podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ron, for this honor. You have no idea, man, how this much means to me. Well, you're an inspiration to all of us, and I wish you nothing but good health and great oh, thank success you. You in too, the Ron. future. You too, Yep. And in all your endeavors. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, comments and suggestions for the podcast, you can email me at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. We have a Facebook group and we have a page. It's a wrap with rap. We're on Instagram. That it's a wrap with too. rap podcast. Uh, you, all the episodes are on YouTube. It's a wrap with rap the podcast. On <laughs> and we have a website. It's a wrap with rap.com. And right now we're, uh, we just got merchandise and logo merchandise, uh, showcasing the podcast with a logo caps uh t-shirts that kind of thing so you can find that on the website as well as other uh podcast information i want to thank everyone for listening i want everybody to please stay safe and for now it's a wrap